All right, in this video, we're going to discuss center of mass and torque. So the center of mass is fairly simply defined. It literally is the center of mass. So for instance, if you were carrying a pizza box, you certainly wouldn't want to carry the pizza box uh, at the corner, right? If you put the pizza box with your hand under the corner of the box, it's certainly gonna fall off your hand. So you wanna put your hand at the center of the box at its center of mass. So you can hold the box there and it will be an equilibrium. Now, for the MCAT, there is an equation that you can use to calculate the center of mass. And it's equal to, here, XCM is the position of the center of mass. It's equal to mass one times its position plus mass two times its position plus additional masses and positions if you have multiple objects, divided by the sum of all the masses. Now, the reason why we're talking about center of mass with relation to torque is that generally, objects will rotate about their center of mass. So, for example, if you were to take a hammer, a hammer, you know, has a wooden stick, and at one end you have the metal head. The metal is heavier than the rest of the wooden handle. So you know the center of mass isn't in the center, it's closer to the metal head. So if someone were to take a hammer and throw it such that the hammer rotates, the hammer doesn't rotate about the center of the hammer. It will rotate about its center of mass. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example question. In this case, we're asking, what is the center of mass of a mallet made with a half meter, two kilogram stick with a three kilogram block attached on the end? So we can draw out the situation. We have a half meter stick with a three kilogram block attached to the end. To calculate the center of mass, we need to first define a position that we're gonna call zero. Now, it doesn't matter where you define the position as zero, but you just have to be consistent when you're calculating the positions for each of your masses. So in this case, let's go ahead and call zero the very start of the stick. So there's gonna be zero centimeters. So now to calculate our center of mass, we can have our equation. XCM is equal to mass one. Here we can say our first mass is the stick, so it's gonna be two kilograms. We now need to multiply by the position of the stick. Now here, it might seem a little complicated because the stick is occupying a whole range of positions, you know, zero centimeters to 50 centimeters. However, when we're thinking about the center of mass, we pinpoint the location of the mass at the center of the objects. So that would mean that we would consider the two kilogram mass to act at the center of the half meter stick. So you would say the position is in the middle of the stick, which if it's half a meter, its position will be 0 0.25 meters. We then need to add the other at mass. Our other mass is the three kilogram block. We need to add its position. It's located at the end of the stick, which is half a meter long. So that would be 0 0.5 meters. And then we need to divide by the sum of the masses, two kilograms and three kilograms. So if we calculate, we can see, first of all, that all the kilograms are gonna cancel out. So the unit we're gonna be left with is meters, which makes sense because we're calculating a position, the position of the center of mass. So on the top, we have two times 0.25, which is a half. Half plus 1.5 is gonna give us two. So we have two divided by five. So that's gonna be our answer two over five meters or 0 0.4 meters. So that means in terms of this mallet, the center of mass is going to be 0.4 meters along the stick, so fairly close to the mallet, which is heavier than the stick. All right, so that's how the center of mass works and that's how you can calculate the center of mass for the MCAT. Let's now move on to torque. Torque is a twisting force 
that produces rotation. So, so far when we've been looking at forces, we've been looking at how you can apply forces on object to cause translational motion, to cause objects to change their position. You push a box, it moves. And with torque, we're not thinking about changing the position of objects, we're looking at causing objects to rotate. Now, there is an equation for the torque, it's equal to Rf sine theta. In this case, R is the lever arm, it's equal to the distance between the pivot, which is the rotation point, and the point at which the force acts. F, of course, is going to be the force, and theta, this is the angle between the force vector and the lever arm vector. Now, finally, it's important to understand that with forces, you can think about different directions, up, down, left, right, horizontal versus vertical. Torque, you don't have those directions. Instead, when we think about the directions for torque, we're thinking about torque that can produce clockwise rotation or torques that can produce counterclockwise rotation. So to see how this works, let's take a look at an example. And here we have a very biologically relevant example where we have a situation where a person is, you're looking at their arm, so this is their arm, this is their forearm, and they're holding a mass. And the question is asking, what force must the bicep exert to hold the mass in place? The first thing to recognize here is, if we want to hold the mass in place, what this means is, we want the net torque to equal zero. That means we don't want our bicep to be doing any clockwise rotation. We also don't want to do any counterclockwise rotation. We just want to hold the mass in place. And in this situation, we're given a number of pieces of information. Number one, the mass you're holding is 10 kilograms. The mass of the forearm, right, technically to hold your arm in position, you also have to exert full force with your biceps. The forearm is 4 kilograms of mass, and the forearm's length is 40 centimeters, and your biceps, which we know is in your arm, is connected at a position of 2 centimeters from the pivot, from the elbow. So how do we do this calculation? Well, again, it's helpful that they're telling us that we want to hold the mass in place. That means the net torque is zero. If the net torque is zero, that means your clockwise torque has to cancel out with your counterclockwise torque. Right? This is very similar to the idea before, where if the net force in the horizontal direction is zero, that means your forces towards the right and your forces towards the left must also be equal. So we can say in this situation that we have our counterclockwise torques must balance our clockwise torques. The next thing for us to think about is, well, which forces are going to produce clockwise torque and which ones produce counterclockwise torques? And you can base this on the pivot, right? This point right here is the pivot. Rotation is going to occur about this point. And you can look at this forearm and just ask, is each of these masses, are they going to cause it to rotate clockwise or is it going to cause it to rotate counterclockwise? And what you can appreciate is, well, this mass here is going to have a weight, all right? This is going to be a force that is going to produce clockwise torque. Same with this forearm. It also has a weight that is going to produce clockwise torque. But we do have this biceps, which is going to be producing a force going up. And this force is going to want to make the arm rotate counterclockwise. All right, so this is going to be the force of the biceps, and this will produce counterclockwise torques. So in other words, we can write this out as you have the torque from the bicep is going to be equal to the sum of the torque from the forearm, mass one, plus the torque from the mass you're holding, mass two. Okay, 
So now to solve for these values, we have our equation RF sine theta. So R is going to be the distance from the pivot to where the force acts. So you can see the bicep is attached two centimeters from the, from the pivot. So that means R is going to be two centimeters. The force that we want to exert, we're solving for. So that's the force of the bicep. And then you want sine of the angle. In this case, the angle isn't exactly 90 degrees, but it's close enough to 90 degrees that we can assume that it's essentially 90 degrees. It's almost perpendicular. This is going to be equal to torque for mass one. This mass, we know it's acting at the center of the forearm. Again, if you have an object, its weight is assumed to act at the middle. So the distance is going to be halfway along the forearm, so 20 centimeters times its force, which is mass times gravity, which mass one is four kilograms, times gravity, 10 meters per second squared. And here, the angle, again, is going to be 90 degrees. That's torque for mass one. You now need to add torque for mass two, which acts at the end of the forearm, which is 40 centimeters. Its mass is 10 kilograms. Gravity is still 10 meters per second squared. And this is also acting at 90 degrees. So now you can start to do some calculations that first of all, on both sides, all the centimeters are gonna cancel out. And the kilogram meters per second squared, we know that's gonna give us newtons. So that's gonna give us the correct units for the force of the biceps, which is what we want. Sine of 90 is also going to equal one. So we can essentially ignore those as well. So we said the centimeters will cancel out. Sine of 90 is gonna to go to one. So then looking at the numbers on the left side, we're going to have two times the force of the bicep is going to equal 20 times four times 10, which is going to equal 800 newtons plus 40 times 10 times 10, which is going to equal 4,000 newtons. So that's going to give us 4,800 divided by two. That means the bicep has to exert a force of 2,400 newtons in order to hold the mass in place. So this is an example of how you can calculate the different torques for a type of question you might see on the MCAT.